Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Martin Kye. So Martin is an extremely experienced uh, contact improvisation dance teacher. If I do my maths right here, he's been teaching since 1980, which is uh, a year after I was born. So that would make 37 years of practice. Um, joining us from Canada today, he's very experienced in contact dance and other kinds of movement work. Been working with all kinds of diverse groups, written a book on it. It's come highly recommended to me. So Martin, welcome. Mark, thank you for having me. So what's your story with the body? How did you get interested in working with the body? It's funny. I I grew up in a theater family and I grew up in television studios and on the sides of theater stages and on stages. And I really thought that I was going to be an actor. And I had this fantasy of many um, Academy Awards on my mantle. And then when I realized how competitive that world is, I realized I am not constitutionally um, set up for this. Right. And so from there, I made the leap and I thought, okay, I'm going to get really political. And I was at Stanford University and started doing political theater there and guerrilla theater where we were educating the campus about the school's investments in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And actually got that school to be the first school to divest um, from all their investments in South Africa. But there as well, I realized that um, my motives were suspect because I really didn't know that much about what was going on in South Africa, but I loved it when people leaned to the left and leaned to the right on the other side of the megaphone. Um, So... From there, I went, okay, I'm going to become spiritually enlightened instead. Um, And I hitchhiked 25,000 miles visiting different religious centers and ashrams and monasteries and ended up becoming a priest, um, a Zen priest. And I think of those days, though, as my cult days, because like in many of those schools, it turned out that the head teacher was fucking his senior students and laundering money and had a group of people who would go around and beat up people who didn't agree with him. And I wasn't high enough up in the organization to know that was going on, but I could feel it. Um, But in that time, I would go to this place in Berkeley, California um, called Dance Jam, which was the second ecstatic dance in the world. The first one was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and then one started in Berkeley. And when I went, one of the things I loved to do was to roll around on the floor and roll around on the floor with other people. And this one day somebody said to me, oh, you know, here's, here's a way you could do it more effectively. And I was a little bit confused, but I went, oh, are you, is this some kind of dance form? And he went, yeah, it's called contact improvisation. And I was ecstatic. I signed up for three classes that week. Um, In my first year, I did four month-long intensives, and this was 79. By the end of that year, I was teaching, I was performing, and it kind of set this whole new destiny of my life um, to be dancing. And now, 38 years later, I'm still at it. And what was it about contact that really hooked you mind? What was it that made you go, yeah, this is something I really want to, you know, having had these kind of false starts or, you know, other interests previously with politics and art and Zen, like what was it about contact you thought, yeah, this is the thing? Well, a few things. One, um, I realized that I kind of have an an allergy to dogma. Mm. And certainly Buddhism and religion is full of dogma. And this form seemed to not be colored by that. Every person, in a sense, completes it with themselves. There's a way to look at ballet, at contemporary dance, as dance forms that, because they're made for performance, they go out and they penetrate space and they colonize space. But in contact improvisation, we let the form come in and colonize us. Um, And it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. So you and I are just meeting today. We're having our first conversation ever. And 
here's just one of my definitions of contact improvisation. Um, you, you and I, we bring certain skills to the conversation. We, we, we know grammar. We have these words we can put together in sentences. We can follow certain topics. Hopefully, we both have the ability to listen, to express strong ideas, to maybe bring the conversation down to deeper levels. Um, and contact improvisation is somewhat the same thing. It, it's a physical conversation. It's two people primarily, although sometimes more, most of the time in physical contact. And it's as if you come to it and you are this puzzle of abilities. You have certain um, parts of your body that are strong, certain parts that aren't, certain parts that are flexible, certain parts that aren't. You have a certain narrative to your life and certain limitations to your body. And I bring those same things and we get into physical contact and we see where those two puzzles go together. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just magical to have this form that had no steps. It is generally not done to music. Every pair of people create their own rhythm by where they go together. Some folks will be dancing and it will be very slow and meditative. And others, it will be really athletic and acrobatic and playful with a lot of falling to the floor and flying at each other. So just depending on the two puzzles that get together on any given day is what comes out of the dance. Yeah. So it has this spontaneous relational quality, doesn't it? It's not a pre-planned set of steps. It's something that really happens in the moment in, and in the meeting. Yes. Yes. And one way to look at it, it's like open source um, programming of apps and software that rather than Microsoft or Balanchine or Martha Graham, where everything comes from the top down, how we have to work within that software or in that choreography open source software is from the ground up. We're all writing code to it. We're all creating it, the research into this form as we're dancing. So there's no central control. Everybody who dances the form is actually writing code and informing the, the worldwide research of the form. Yeah, and this is actually quite unique because there are dance forms that like five rhythms where, you know, I think two of them came about roughly the same time, a bit different, but roughly. Yeah both three dance forms though in, in different ways. Um, though, you know, Fire Rhythms has this kind of top-down structure and someone's in charge of it and teachers have to be certified to a certain thing. Whereas contact is sort of much more freeform and, and it's in the structure. It's not like someone's intellectual property and it's not, you know, you just become a teacher when you're ready and people respect you enough. Yes, and, and it's interesting because C Steve Paxton, who was a Cunningham dancer, and he was experimenting with the principles of this form. And in 1972, he invited a whole bunch of people from different universities uh, to New York City, mostly athletes. Um, some of them were dancers, but mostly were athletes, to investigate these principles that he was thinking about that became contact improvisation. And they worked all day long for a week and at night this was right after videotape was um, invented so they would look at what they did and then they performed eight hours a day for a week um, in new york city and those people who were in that first piece all went home and they didn't want to stop doing it so mm -hmm they started teaching their friends and leading classes um, so they could have people to continue to investigate with. And the form has gone out in concentric circles around the world, body to body that way. And Steve Paxton um, and several other people who were in that first piece who created a touring company in the beginning called Reunion, and they went around and the name of the performance was um, contact improvisation, you come and see what we do. And they would just, not in any performative way, just move together so people could see it. But that group began to hear of people getting injured um, in learning the form. And they thought, oh, we better trademark it. We better put some mm -hmm. control on it. And they actually had an attorney draw up the papers and everybody who was gonna sign it, I think 10, names were put on it of the 10 people who, in a sense, would be the contact improvisation police. 
And they looked at this form and they went, is this how we want to live our lives? Is policing this dance form? And they came up with an alternative. They said, no, let's have a way that we can all communicate together. And they created Contact Quarterly magazine as a way that everybody who was researching could be in touch with one another. And they said, okay, this form has communication, but no central control. And I think it's one of the blessings of the forum. And one reason that it has spread as much as it has, because everybody gets to own it who does it. Yeah, it's interesting. There seems to be real pros and cons to going both ways with this. And, you know, certainly on one end of a spectrum here that kind of no one's copywriting it or kind of teaching it in that way. I mean, are there any disadvantages to that kind of very open source way of doing things? Well, of course there are. Um, It it means that anybody can lay their aesthetic on it. Um, It means as more people come into it, it it has the potential to dilute. Um, But so far, that's not what has happened. The form has become less rough and tumble. It it almost at one point was kind of like cowboy contact. We, We were much... Um, less precious about it. And I think what happened when, when Steve invited that first group, he says that he invited them based on survivability. Could they survive all these principles that he was going to throw at them? And which is why they were athletes and dancers. Mm. But as the forum has developed, we now teach survivability. So really anybody can come to this forum, including you know, people who are blind come to it, people who are in wheelchairs come to it, because if I'm a movement puzzle and I'm dancing with somebody who can only move from you know, the third vertebra and their thoracic up, that's the puzzle they dance with. And so in a sense, everybody's invited. It's a very magnanimous form now. Um, it's not quite as risky and... and um, experimental as it once was yeah i mean my experience is it's remarkably safe it doesn't look safe sometimes but i've, I've seen remarkably few injuries over the years of doing you know what looks can be quite look athletic looking or crazy looking yeah. and also yeah. inclusive you know i've seen people turn up to class many times their first class maybe not you know not dancers not in great shape but still be able to have a really good time mm-hmm. have you danced contact do you know the form oh, yeah, yeah i mean i'm I'm coming out of 20 years of Aikido and then 10 uh-huh. years ago I did my first contact class and uh, now dance fairly regularly in Brighton. I'm not, you know, I'm not a very good dancer, but I, you know, I'm, I, for a number of years I've been playing with it. And, you know, Aikido was the uncle of contact improvisation because Steve was practicing Aikido in the beginning and that first group, they basically worked with three different um, skills and one of them was Aikido roles. So there's a way in which that whole idea of taking strong energy and blending and redirecting it is definitely part of the DNA of this form. Yeah, and I think there's particular types of Aikido where contact between Uki and Nagi, the thrower and throwers, really stress certain teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, A, there's that side of the contact of Aikido. And B, if you're a high level Aikido, there's a creativity where you're really listening in to the partner rather than doing a form where it becomes, and if you're trained in those two forms of Aikido, which I happen to be, uh, it's extremely like contact. And it's, for me, it's actually quite challenging not to throw people in contact. (laughs) That's sort of in my system. But um, most Aikido has less in common with contact, I think, than certain kinds that have those two features. People who come from Aikido to the form or people who come from martial arts in general to the form, in the long run, all that body information is incredibly helpful for them. But in the beginning, it's often a challenge because martial artists often have an incredible connection to their center. And they often have this taproot they can send way to the center of the earth. And it's an amazing ability and skill to have that but ultimately in contact improvisation you want to be polycentric you want to have many centers in the body so that when you're in this conversation with somebody you have parts of you ready to go in many different directions at any time and you're not just engaging one center but you can have many centers engaged simultaneously 
yeah, I found the idea of, of being uprooted still do quite difficult in that, you know, in contact, you might be surfing on someone, going across them and kind of being light in the air and as a martial mm-hmm. as you don't want to be thrown. So that, that for me was, is, it was and still is a challenge sometimes. And something I find quite fascinating when I go to a contact class is feeling the bodies of the different movers like I was in a class once and this guy had this kind of weird circular thing going on, but it was kind of small. And I was like, what is that? And I said, what do you do? And he said, Wing Chun Kung Fu. And I was like, oh, it's Wing Chun. That makes sense. Or you know, I'll feel the ballet in someone or I'll feel uh-huh. the tango in someone. Do you, do you have that experience of kind of feeling the different practices that are kind of in someone's system when you do contact? Yes. The, the practices they've done. Um, and, you know, are they somebody who receives body work or not? Um, are they somebody who works with any kind of st- ability trainings to get strong or to get flexible? Because it all influences the dance. I, I, I like to say there's two kinds of dancers. It, it's not completely true. Maybe there's five kinds or seven kinds, but there's what I call the secret rivers of sensation dancers. And they're the people who come into the dance and they, love to go to this internal place and see the rivers of sensation in their bodies and how they relate to another body and um, move slowly down those pathways together. And then there are what I call the wind in the face dancers. And they're the ones who love to feel the wind going by their cheeks. They love to fall. They love to get adrenalized. Um, They love to be in risk and where they don't know how something they enter is going to resolve itself, often because they're falling with their partner. And So that's one thing I I often notice when I'm dancing with somebody for a first time. We all do both, but is somebody's leaning towards the the rivers of sensation or is somebody's leaning towards something that's faster and a little bit more acrobatic and adrenalized? Um, I am a definite wind-in-the-face dancer who aspires to be a better rivers of sensation dancer. And do, do you notice any difference cross-culturally, like teaching in different countries? Definitely. Um, it, it's very interesting because where contact improvisation is the biggest in the world is in Argentina. Yeah. And also Chile and Uruguay are quite, quite big with the form. So if you go to Buenos Aires, there are 10 jams a week you can attend. And most of them are free. And they're four hours long. They're longer than in most cities. Um, because so many people there do the form. And there's something about that band of South America, because the same is true in Chile and Uruguay, where people come to the form with a little bit less tone in their bodies. And as a result, they can listen um, more clearly. And so they have a much quicker success with the form because they already... They, they don't, they're not overly toned. So it's like with a violin, you know, what is that perfect tone for being able to listen and engage with another body? And in most cultures, we come to it with a little bit too much tone. And so that's one difference. You go to the South of South America and people learn it really fast. It's very satisfying for me as a teacher because it's like, oh, I'm such a good teacher. Look how quickly they're learning it. But it's actually cultural. And I heard you go, they take their clothes it, off in South America when dancing contacts. Is that, is that, was I well informed or am I thinking of somewhere else? So say that again. I had this, some contact jams where people are sort of taking their clothes on and off during a jam. Is, I, is, I'm, I think that gets investigated everywhere at some point or another where people okay. go, oh, wait, let's see what that's like. Um, I think it doesn't seem to ever continue anywhere. So I think it, people find it's quite impractical. Yeah. Um, it, it's really interesting to try that and to see everything that comes up around it. I, I've certainly been to jams that were naked jams. Um, but at first, you're kind of sticky. And then when you break a sweat, you get really slippery. And it actually is hard to, to listen in that state to another body. And it's even more challenging to get athletic because of getting so slippery. 
I love, I love how you just get... this is a purely practical thing, Martin. It's, it's, it comes up to me thinking about it. It's like, wow, I'm incredibly intimate with a bunch of people I don't necessarily know well. But uh, I see the, the practical problem. The same thing happens in grappling arts. Once people, you know, in round three of a UFC fight, it's very difficult to do any good jujitsu because people get too slippy. Uh-huh. Different it's... perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Culturally, I just want to add just a yeah, couple culture, more things. You know, because I, I, just, I just touched on the South of South America, but just to speak about like differences in different places. Um, in Northern Europe, for the longest time, they would only meet for classes or rehearsals. They would never jam. And that's actually beginning to change now, but they wanted structure there. And in Finland, they love to fly um, as part of the dancing. When I teach in Germany, it, it's very common there for people to have kind of a binocular gaze, to, to look, be very focused forwards. And it's really interesting. Um, I, I taught a workshop there once, and everybody in the circle, I looked around the circle, and I went, boy, everybody's super focused, straight forward, except there was one person who wasn't. And I realized she was from England. She was the only person in the circle that wasn't German. And so a big part of contact improvisation is softening the gaze so that you can take information in from everywhere around you. Um, do they have that in martial arts too, where, where you yeah, soften, I, take often, in the peripheral vision? Yeah, often people will advise to sort of to look at the throat and then just soften the vision so you take everything in rather than look, make eye contact, which can be misleading in, in a number of ways. And also from a sort of multiple attacker point of view, if you're focused on one person, you get mm -hmm. hit back of the head by someone else. So in contact improvisation, to know what everybody is doing in the room and also all parts of your body, it's, I call it the whale watching gaze or the mm -hmm. savanna gaze. Because if, if you're out on safari or if you're out on a whale watching trip and you get like binocular vision, you're, you're not going to see the whales. But when you soften the vision, because we actually see movement in our peripheral vision, um, then you're more likely to see that lion that's moving through the bush or to see the whale um, come up through the water. And so it's part of what we need to learn in the form. And so that's one little difference in that culture. It always interests me also where people sit, like when you say, oh, let's come and sit in a circle mm. and in some countries people sit in New Zealand people make the biggest circles with so much space between they like them and space. Especially, yeah. Yeah. they have so much space in that country but in Argentina they come and they're all their knees are all crossed each other they're all sitting and touching it's yeah as a teacher it's fascinating going to different countries yeah, it's a bit of an obsession with this podcast because we have guests from so many places and I endeavor to get, you know, lots of guests who are not just British or American on. And mm -hmm. uh, we have a large audience in Australia, Russia, Germany and Sweden. Um, so I don't know if you had any context experiences in Australia or Sweden or, or, or Russia because there are other, you know, big groups who listen to this podcast. Um, I've not taught in Sweden. I've, I've definitely taught in Australia and New Zealand. And those cultures are very different, um, I think, because of the Maori influence in New Zealand. It's been a long time since I've been there, though. I'm not sure I can give you anything poignant about teaching in those countries. That's uh, OK. I went to, I went to a, a jam in Moscow quite recently, and uh, I was struck by how, in some ways, how similar it was to a sort of hippie jam in Brighton, you know, the kind of hippie town in England where I live. And, and that, that contrasted quite sharply with the kind of normal, angular... Russian intense big city nature of Moscow actually is more of a contrast with the rest uh -huh. of the city than it was with other contact improv. No, it's amazing to me in Russia, I think because of the whole history in the Soviet Union and the whole thing about discipline in the arts that the Russians really take the form as a discipline mm -hmm. and they, they give it hours every day and, and they're wonderful talking about the form it's an interesting form in that language is so important in it. I'll never forget this one time I was teaching in this big dance complex in Oakland, California that had many studios. I was teaching with Ray Chung there, a three-week intensive. And in one of our breaks, I was walking through the building and there was one of the studios had a, 
a beginner's contact class in it. And every door to every studio had a little window in it. And I was out in the hallway and I noticed two modern dance teachers were looking in through the window. And one of them leaned over to the other. She looked really concerned on her face. And she said, I can't believe it. They're talking again. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what, what they found so odd about this form is actually something that I love about it and something that helped me get my book written about it, which is that we try to bring language to our experience. We, we, we have a dance with somebody or we have a jam and then we go in and we try to see if we can cultivate, well, what was it that I discovered? What was it that got in my way? What is it that I'm learning? Um, from this particular puzzle today. And, and in Russia, this is what set this off. They're really good around language, around the form, because I think of that discipline that they bring. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised there's so little debriefing contact. Often I find it very interesting psychologically, and I'm seeing all kinds of patterns, and most places it's just, well, let's just dance. Huh. Is that the norm, or have I just come across places that are less talky than others? Maybe it's balanced half and half, and you've probably come across the ones where there's less of that. I, I think the more long-term teachers, the ones who've been around for a while, definitely um, the talking aspect is important. The research aspect is important. Mm. There is this idea around that it's a kind of research, isn't it? That, that That's quite an unusual word to hear around dance. Mm -hmm. it, it's personal research, and it's also research for the form as a whole. One aspect that I, I, attracts me to this form is that it's a, it's a compassionate mirror to who we are in all of our relationships. Mm -hmm. And so the, the choices we make when we're dancing often reflect who we are in our romantic relationships, in our friend relationships. And by researching the form and noticing what you do habitually, you, the form then becomes this compassionate mirror that you notice what's habitual and then you go, ooh, there that is again. What else could I try here? Yeah. So if somebody comes to the form and they're super manipulative with their hands or they always give weight but they never support weight or they're always the supporter but they never let themselves yield their weight to somebody else, often you look at them outside the dance studio and they're very manipulative or they're always seeking support or they're always offering support. It's, it's what they do in their relationships. And that's a big aspect of the research for a lot of people is like, what does the dance form teach me about who I am? Yeah, this is what I'm most interested in actually at in contact at the moment I'm wanting to explore is for me, the body is holographic. You know, how we do one thing is how we do most things. So there's, you know, contextual. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious. Like, you know, in yoga, we explore this. Like, hey, look how you do your warrior pose or look how you do your, you find it difficult to do forward bends or child pose or whatever. Like in embodied yoga as a system I work with, we use that principle a lot. And it just strikes me in contact, there's so much juicy stuff going on in terms of boundaries. You know, you talked about manipulativeness in terms of risk taking. You talked a bit about earlier. Like that stuff's fascinating and it's constantly being brought up uh, in the dance. Yes. Yes. I, I like that phrase you use that it's holographic or it's, it's almost like a fractal to our bigger lives. Um, it's, it's this clear reflection. I, I'll never forget, I had been dancing about a year. And I was in a month long intensive in San Francisco with Mangrove, which was originally this group of men who performed contact. At this point, it was they'd let it, women into the company. It was men and women. And it was one of the breaks, and I was sitting, eating with, and three of the teachers were at the table, and I was lamenting to them, saying, oh, God, I just I can't believe it. I'm so bored with my patterns. I keep doing the same thing over and over again. And I'm lamenting away, and I look up, and all three of them are, like, smiling at me. They're all beaming at me. And Freddie Long says, this is such great news. She says, as soon as you're getting bored of your patterns, it means you're becoming aware of them. And they said, you know, when you're aware of them, then there is the chance to actually go another way. And Byron Brown said, you know, one 
um, definition of an advanced contact improviser is somebody who's gone through waves and waves of boredom with their patterns. And it's really true. If you're dancing hip to hip with somebody and you always find that you scoop your hips under them and lift them up onto your lower back, yeah. and then you begin to notice that, oh, there that is again. And then you can begin to notice it before you do it. And you can go, oh, what if I offer the ride, but then take us to the floor? Or what if I don't do anything there and see what the dance is offering me beyond the willfulness I'm bringing to the dance? Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the ways I play with it. I'm kind of noticing, oh, look, I want to control everything and I'm not listening. Yep. And I just want to, you know, martial arts, I want to grab the person and do a hip throw because it's fun. Uh, you know, maybe not throw them, but have them sort of up in the air, especially as some nice young lady and she's going to get joy from that, you know? And um, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm the big strong man and there she is. I'm, you know, I'm recreating this gender role of the supportive man. Uh, uh -huh. like There's a sort of political kind of recreation there as well as a personal one. And, uh, and then I go, okay, maybe actually I want to be on top. Maybe I want to lose control. Maybe I want to listen in more and see what wants to happen rather than imposing my will upon this. So for me, at that point, it's a practice. It's not just a self-awareness raising exercise. Yes. And, and what I've become interested in recently is um, there's the habits we throw in, but there's also what I call our terminus stations. And somebody who's new comes to the form. It, it's like when a city is laying down their, their bus routes and their subway routes and the system is small at first and the bus will go to the terminus station then turn around and go back the other way. Mm. And it's the same thing in movement. Somebody will come to the dance and, and they'll go to a place and then they turn back and they dance some more and then they add some other lines. So halfway through they can turn up this way and then they turn back. And as they dance more and more, there becomes more and more of a, of a, of routes they can take. But I'm really interested in investigating that place that we turn back, like what's beyond. And so that's, again, first of all, noticing that I turn back. Oh, I'm rolling up somebody's body, but their head is right there on the floor, and I don't want to pour weight into their head, so I turn back. But then I go, do I have to turn back right there? Is there a way that I can unweight the core of my body and send support out into my limbs that I can roll right over their head rather than turn back there. And I've noticed over the decades, and especially in the last year that I've really been investigating this piece of the terminus stations, that really advanced contact dancers, seasoned, let's call them seasoned contact dancers, they have no terminus station. They will choose to turn back at any time, but this idea that as you're dancing with them, this feeling that they don't have to turn back. And so I'm now thinking in terms of my teaching, ooh, how can I cultivate this both in my own dancing, but also in the, in the dancing of my students, that we become aware of our habitual movement patterns and where they end and we turn back into them. Mm, nice, nice. I like that a lot. And in terms of sort of some of the other personal growth stuff in contact, this is in, in a way that the thing I found hardest to find a contact improv teacher to talk about actually, and you were one of the names that came up and it took me a bit of research. So I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about some of the ways we can see our patterns in contacts and then work with those. Hmm. Let me approach that question because you said there's a lot of teachers of different things listening to this podcast mm. and so I think I, I, I love pedagogy. I, I'm not sure actually which I love more, contact improvisation or teaching, because um, the whole question of how we transmit material is so big for me. So how we detect our patterns. I, I once, I, I like to teach labbing where, where people research and make time for people to research. And, and we, in this one workshop in Freiburg, Germany, we did what was called an alternative pathways lab, where we looked at the labs we had, the pathways we have, and then we go, okay, what alternatives are there? And then we came back and each group reported or demonstrated to the whole group. And this one group came back and said, the moment that we go 
to our drawer and pull out the clothes we're going to wear to go to class or a jam. We're setting up our patterns. Mm -hmm. And they say, go stand by somebody your size and change clothes with them. (laughs) And so we all found somebody and I partnered up with this French woman and she had a little spaghetti strap top that showed her midriff and pants that went down to just below her knees. And she switched into my dance clothes and I put on her spaghetti strap top and I ended up teaching the whole rest of the day in this outfit and it completely changed me. Um, For one thing, people were constantly laughing at me, so I couldn't take myself quite so seriously. Um, But just from that point, right from when we're dressing, we're setting up our pathways. And then we arrive into the dance studio, and and this is a thing for teachers, and I would say this is also probably true for a dojo as well, that every studio has a geography to it. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. Most studios have a front. And in a dance studio, that is either where the mirrors are or where the sound system is. And every studio has a place where you can go to be invisible, a place where you can go to be seen and to show off. And I think it's really good as teachers that we go into a studio and realize what is where. Um, Often in front of like if there's a place where people sit there's a little moat there and then you get the more show off people and then people go and hide at the other end of the room same thing if you have mirrors because in contemporary classes or in martial arts classes you have the teacher at that side and then you get the more experienced students and then the less experienced students at at the back and when i go in to teach i generally start from the side that is not the front, to just break that up. And I also notice where my eyes won't go into the room because I want to teach to everybody in the room. And if my body or eyes can't see everybody, then I can't teach to everybody. And I feel, again, this is like a reflection of our bodies. There's certain parts of our bodies where that show off, that love to be the center of attention. And there's parts that like to hide and or be numb. And my feeling is if we can get to know the whole geography of the dance studio, we can also then get in and conversely see and feel the whole geography of the body. That's nice. I mean, some Japanese dojos are very formally set up with a showman at front and a right. you know, junior students have to sit on the right and then, you know, in grade order kind of thing. And the junior students are normally closest to the door. You know, sometimes it's very formal, mm-hmm. but, I've noticed my patterns around this. Like I go to a fire rhythms class and I, I often find myself dancing near the teacher, like near the DJ. And I was kind of like mm-hmm. wondering, okay, is that like, I want to be close to them. Is that where I feel safest? Is that, you know, I'm a teacher myself. So is that my kind of happy place, you know, the teaching end. And I've, I've, I've noticed this with students, like when I work with circles of chairs, certain students who are also teachers will come and take my chair. Like, like they'll, they'll be the same one. I'm like, it's kind of the, often the student who kind of wants to be the teacher, you know, or who's used mm-hmm. to that role for better or for worse. And I'm like, okay, it's happened twice now that you've taken my chair. Okay, you know, I'm not attached to that chair, but that's kind of interesting, you know, to notice some of those unconscious like patterns playing out. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there when you start looking, isn't there? Like how you take partners, uh, as I said, from how you dress, how you walk in, how you leave. Like I often say to my yoga students, like in the gaps, there's honesty. Because as soon as we start observing ourselves, people start acting. They start being socially Mm -hmm. constructed, right, in a different way. Whereas the real honest patterns often come out in the space between the the more obviously observed positions. (laughs) You you were just saying the thing about finding a partner. Yeah. I think three of the most interesting words in the English language are find a partner. (laughs) Because... It is amazing what happens in the room. You, you see some people, like they leap across the room to choose somebody to dance with. Um, yeah. that there's no waiting at all. They, they look around, they choose. And they choose Other people, they're very clear. I'm choosing this person. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like they know who they want to work with and they're not going to leave anything up to chance. Yeah. 
there's some people who open their eyes really wide and they look around the room and they see whose eyes they meet up with and then they partner with them. And then there's that whole group of people when you say find a partner and their chins drop and their eyes drop and they, they slouch a little bit and they like say, come and find me. Yeah, and for I, me, it's so interesting to say those words to a group, find a partner. And then I say, stop. Yeah. What did you just do? <laughs> and then I kind of, I name some of the different strategies. And then I say, what do you normally do when you hear those words? And then I'll say, okay, please go find a partner and try something else. Martin, I'm so sad because that's, I thought I'd invented that exercise and you've got there ahead of me. Like I'll say, find a partner. And then I'll say, stop, like literally half a second later. <laughs> And I'll say, what are you doing right now? And I call it bees and flowers. I say, are you a bee? You're a flower. Okay, what kind of bee are you? You're a direct bee or a friendly bee? Are you an open flower or a kind of closed flower? Like, like a, oh. I give some metaphors. I give some examples of the person who kind of makes eye contact. And it's like, do you love me? Who loves me? You know, and the, and the, and the person who's like, I bet no one wants to be my partner. You know, and I can exaggerate some of these bodies and everyone laughs because they laugh because they're recognizing themselves, you know, and, right, and how you leave right. partners is just as interesting, right? It's like, okay, ladies, I'm done, bye. Or is it like mm -hmm. the clinging, I have to go now, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, like there's, there's equal learning in that. Yes. I, I'm so glad I'm not the only person who, who's <laughs> noticed that. And I love your thing, um, bees and flowers. I might borrow that because I, I do that quite regularly. I, I like that piece of it. There's a lot there if you're looking, isn't it? Um, yes. About politics a little bit before. Is, is it like I know you've been involved in sort of different groups and like the sort of social side of it. Is there a way you see uh, any of that larger you know, for example, like, you know, the classic one is like man spreading. Well, I've noticed in groups, um, Americans take up far more space in the conversation than Brits, for example, like yeah, yes. the number of minutes they speak or the posture, the width of the postures men will take compared to women. I mean, do you notice any of those kind of almost political patterns? Um, but I want to, I want to get to that, but you, you just, um, kind of stimulated something in me with, okay. with the bees and flowers thing. Um, I, I teach a workshop called 101 Ways to Say No to Contact Improvisation. <laughs> and you were talking about how people get together, but then also how they end things. And it's interesting. Robert Bly has a book called um, A Little Book on the Human Shadow. And he has this image in it that I love, um, which is that, we all have a door in our psyches. And when we're little kids, the doorknob is on the outside. And big people come and they're constantly opening and shutting our door and they're wiping our butts and they're feeding us and they're putting us places and telling us what we can do and can't do. But as we get older, ideally, if things go well, the doorknob comes to the inside of the door and we decide when and for whom we open and close the door. And people who, as growing up, kind of had the door splintered somewhat because of people abusing them or forcing their way in, they have a hard time bringing the doorknob onto the inside. And I think it's an incredibly healthy practice to set boundaries. Um, and so one of those ways is, is having people end dances and learning that they have the ability um, or give them the ability, the ways you can end dances. And I'll often have a group moving through the room. And if, if somebody initiates a dance, the other person has the responsibility to end it within a minute. And by learning that you can end a dance, then it feels much more safe to start a dance because you know you have that ability. Um, if you know that you can say no to touch, that you can like turn the faucet off all the way, then you're more able to really let touch in more deeply. If we learn how to not let ourselves be lifted, how to move our center away from our partner so that we become way too heavy to lift, then we conversely can extrapolate, oh, this is how I put my center over my partner and make myself light to go up. And so just when you, you mentioned that thing about um, endings, 
mm. for me, and, and a great part of my, my teaching is to teach boundary setting to all kinds of things because of how much it teaches us about the other side of it. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've sent students to contact dance as a way of learning boundaries. I say, look, people are going to try and roll all over you. They're going to, you know, they're going to kind of come very close to you. It's like, and this is a great place, uh, robust students, I should say. This is a, a great place to practice actually saying no mm -hmm. in, in a safe way, you know. And, and uh, you know, I have met some boundaryless people in, in contact, God love them, and uh, yeah. had some great experience there. So, you know, for me, it's a place to experience that and to walk away and also to receive it. You know, like I think dance is a great place to receive a no because it's, it's not so consequential if I walk up to a girl in tango and say, hey, do you want to dance? And she says, no, thank you. That's not so, con you know, it still might hurt a bit, but it's not so consequential as things in my life, you know. Um, uh, sometimes the practice with students is I want you to leave your partner or I want you to practice being left and not being the one who's always leaving or which of those do you need to practice you choose, you know, or you know, there's, there's so many practices there practice leaving without clinging or another one practice being alone for a bit, not having to constantly have, you know, I was talking to a male friend of mine earlier. He's like, I've never been single. I constantly have girlfriends. I said, well, take a month off, man. You know, just split up with your girlfriend. Don't get a new one straight away. Be with yourself for a month, you know, try that as a practice if you want. And uh, I feel like there's, there's so much richness in all of those things. Mm -hmm. So that, that was um, a segue. You were taking us towards the political. Yeah, if you're interested to talk about that, I'm not, I think if it's one of your kind of areas. Well, it is. And it's also one of my places that I have an issue with contact improvisation and a lot of somatic practices, actually. Um, I find that most people who practice contact improvisation who are attracted to it, and I would put this into the, a lot of the arts, martial arts, body work, um, are generally quite apathetic. Yeah, um, very political, yeah. And contact improvisation is this incredible refuge. It's this incredible place where we get to see each other's humanity. It's this compassionate mirror to who we are. We, we create this community where it's like a rock tumbler. We get in and we both actually and figuratively bump up against each other and our sharp edges get softened and we kind of get to see the gems that are in each other. And it's just a fabulous refuge of a way to be with people that feels for the most part really good. I mean, certainly for all of us, I think the voices of self-doubt, of judgment come up, but it's this amazing refuge. But so many people I know come to the refuge and get stuck in it. And for me, the truth is we as a civilization are heading over a cliff. And if we don't all choose something to protect, some place to lean on the culture, um, we're going to go over that cliff. And you, you can't just live in the refuge. A refuge, I think, is important. It's an important thing to have. It's an important place to be. But there is so much injustice. There is so much environmental degradation. Um, there is so much shit going on that we really need to all do something. It, it's and for those of us with kids, it becomes even more important that, you know, we can't leave it to the next generation because the cliff is before they even get to grow up. So having said that, um, the whole side of contact improvisation that is about research, I think can really inform how we are politically in the world. And Keith Hennessy, he teaches all over the world, contact, and he's a queer activist. Um, he and a, a group of people from San Francisco have really put a lot of thought to this. And in my book, Dancing Deeper Still, there's a conversation between us called Dancing in Times of War. And they did a great deal of like labbing on how challenging it is to go to protests where there's a lot of anger. Yeah. And a lot of slogans being said that we might not agree with and a lot of tone to it that keeps us home. And really, in a sense, we need to be out there. We need to be counted. And they came up with this way of going to protests together. And 
having the support of each other and creating strong images through dance, through theater, through drumming and, and kind of creating these poetic images that were political. And it was during the first Iraq war and, and Keith and I were both at the Seattle Festival of Alternative Dance and Improvisation. And we were teaching there and they wanted all the teachers to do a, a panel discussion. And they said, you know, oh, what topics could we have? And we gave them a list of like really hot topics, topics that would like bring energy into the room. And they came back and said, well, these are a little too hot for us. We're going to have the topic of, da of dance in the studio and out of the studio. And that was when he and I got really frustrated. And so we, we had this conversation that became this, this essay that went out into the world, Dancing in Times of War. I mean, right there, that's a great question, isn't it? Like, how do you dance in times of war? How do you dance when the environmental destruction of the planet means that all our grandchildren will be dead? You know, like, like mm -hmm. that's, that's some questions right there. And it, it's such an important question. And maybe, maybe it's not in our dance life that we actually take action. Uh, maybe we really keep that just as our refuge. But if, if you close the door and don't look at what's going on, and so many dancers I know, they don't even touch the news. They don't want to know. I'd rather not know is, is a phrase I often yeah, hear. I mean, um, it's because like, it's the same in yoga. It's the same in so many arts. Like you can be in a yeah. safe martial arts world where everything's ordered and structured and, you know, people respect you and you have power and, you know, you look good. Or a yoga world, it's like a God realm where everything's pleasure and bliss and everyone's beautiful. And yep. you know what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah, that's a great refuge and a great place to restore yourself and contact yourself and learn about yourself but it's not the world it, it's 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 a it's a temporary way to rejuvenate or learn about yourself it's not it's not life and, and to replace life mm -hmm. with these uh, oasis is uh it's, it's just i don't know i'm going to be harsh here but it's, it's a sort of spoiled child thing to do if you ask me unfortunately yes so are you involved politically is there something that you're doing I, yeah. I, I've noticed on, on your website and Facebook presence, you, you, you proudly claim that you're more conservative politically. In some ways, yeah. I mean, I'm, for example, I've been involved with um, gay rights in Russia for the last three years in a pretty active way. Um, so that might be considered a more sort of liberal issue. Um, I'm more interested as well at the moment about the reintegration of conservative values from a compassionate point of view. So it's not so much yeah. swinging to a kind of reactionary, you know, American conservative from Alabama or something perhaps, but more like, yeah. okay, what is a kind of higher level integration of liberal values of care and inclusivity uh, with things like boundaries you've been discussing? I mean, that's a classic conservative value is boundaries. And, right. you know, like the sort of let's let everyone into our country is I think as silly as let's let everybody touch me. Um, and I feel like to approach those issues compassionately and intelligently is, is not so common. And that kind of hands over that whole territory to kind of Nazis and racists and the like. Right. And then they dominate the conversation. Exactly. Because someone has to be talking about boundaries. So yeah. like just to stay with the boundaries example, like no is important, whether that be nationally, politically, you know, how we say no to companies, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of elements to that some of which could be considered liberal and some you know whether it's the sort of obnoxious no of the kind of angry protester is there a more mature no that's possible there um or the no to uh the degradation of a uh, culture mm -hmm. and i think the conservative voices are really not so well heard in many of the movement arts it's almost assumed <laughs> I'm super liberal. If people that. are progressive. Yep. And, and in many ways I am. Like the gay stuff that I do is, you know, liberal by any standards. And my ass is on the line. You know, I could be put in prison for that. But it's um Yes. You know, that's serious shit, you know. But it's um I think it's a misassumption that everyone who does dance and certainly everyone who does yoga and martial arts is gonna be left leaning. Yes, and, and what you just said about putting your ass on the line, I, I think that is so important. 
It's, um, and so, yes, gay rights in Russia is putting your ass on the line. It, it's saying, I feel strongly enough about this that I, I'm willing to risk my liberty. And there's too few people doing that. Recently, you put up a article on your Facebook page by David Abram, who mm. is one of my heroes. Um, he wrote Becoming Animal and The Spell of the Sensuous. And his whole thing is that we are not separate from this world around us. And, and we're killing the world around us. And in a sense, we are killing ourselves. And he said something, and many of the people, I have a book called As Much not as much time as it takes. It's called um, Hope Beneath Our Feet, Restoring Our Place in the Natural World. And it's an anthology of 50 people who answered the question, if we really are looking down the barrel of an environmental catastrophe, how do I live my life right now? Mm. And many of the authors in there wrote and said, get to know where you live. Because if you don't know a place, you're not going to defend it. Yeah, and this is and, why I also see, just to jump in, some fairly conservative yep. voices on, on, uh, on the environmental side of things, because it's like, well, it's their farmland, and they hunt on those territories that Trump is trying to sell off. And, you know, there's, uh -huh. there's, 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 they're people that may be more connected to the land than the kind of university liberal. Yes. And, and often the hunter knows the area better than the environmentalist because they spend more time just sitting there waiting and noticing the changes and what's happening. And often it's because of those people that we are learning about, you know, bird populations plummeting or this species disappearing from this area because they actually spend time there. Seven years ago, um, we moved from Massachusetts to Mexico and it, it, there's a whole interesting story there because my arthritis um, was so bad I couldn't dance anymore. And my big toes had almost zero millimeters of movement. And one of my ankles had bone, bone spurs that were so bad that I had to wear special shoes to walk. And the surgeons and the physical therapists all said, oh, you're going to need surgery um, to be able to you know, walk at speed again. And my wife and I, our third boy was off to college and we looked at each other and we, we were both super depleted and tired. And we said, what, what do we want? What do we need in our lives right now? And we both said the same thing. I want a year where I can wake up every morning and say, what do I want to do today? Mm. And you know, we, we've been living all, all this time on my dancer's salary, and we certainly weren't in a practical area place to take a year off, but we both needed it so badly that we actually made it happen. I, um, we found a house sit in San Miguel de Allende, and, and we went to Mexico, and we took a year, and every day we asked, what do I want to do today? And my wife started writing, Liza began to write, and I was too depleted to even write. I mean, my, my second, third book had just come out and I was like, oh, I can't even do that. And I ended up very slowly in barefoot shoes walking in the desert every day. And even though all these people in my book had said, oh, get to know a place, I realized I had never gotten to know a place. And walking up in this place called El Charco del Ingenio, it's a botanical garden, so it has the biggest collection of cactus in the world. Um, it's a place the Dalai Lama has named a, a sanctuary of peace. Um, it's 70 hectares. And I almost every day went up there. And after about, I don't know, three or four months, something in me changed. And I stopped like trying to get to know the place and penetrate the place. And I, I mentioned this before about dancing. I, I let the place penetrate and colonize me. And I began to notice that it was filled with mammals. And I had not seen like that this canyon was filled with squirrels. And I had not seen that there were foxes there. And I hadn't seen the tracks of, of the bobcats and the coyotes. And I began to become like nobody taught me tracking, but the animals taught me tracking. And I began to get to know who lived there. 
And I began to actually have a relationship with some of the animals, including this one fox, this mother fox. And I got to know her through two of her litters of kits. And um, I went on one tour. And when I came back, some of the people who worked in the botanical gardens part of this place said, oh, you know, have you heard about the foxes? I said, no, what happened? And they said, well, people are selling their pelts outside. We think they're being poisoned. And... I immediately went to the places where I would normally kind of meet up with these foxes who, because I had slowed down so much and taken me, you might say, into their confidence. I, it was incredible for me to have this relationship with wild animals. I should say they had a relationship with me because I, I had no control of it. Um, but I could see which animals had disappeared and it was all the animals that kill distemper. And because I was familiar with the place and familiar with who was there and then familiar with who was gone, we were able to establish that that whole part of central Mexico had had all their foxes, all their coyotes, all of the mountain lions and bobcats, all of the raccoons and all of the skunks were gone. Um, because of bad veterinary practices in town with the dogs, distemper had mutated and killed all the wild animals that distemper kills in that part of Mexico. Um, it, it was devastating to me. Um, but this is the thing, we need more people to know where they live because this is happening all over the world. Entire ecosystems are collapsing, species are disappearing, but nobody is there to report about it because people don't know the place. Yeah, Martin, I'm, I'm just looking at the clock here, and I, I, I do want to wrap this one up. We could go on. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a lot here. It's, it's kind of late here in the UK. And, okay. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a heck of a day. <laughs> so, uh, I want to I wanna wrap this one up. This has been fascinating. I'm going to invite you to our conference after we wrap this up, and um, okay. yeah, I want to see you again. I'd certainly love to come to one of your workshops. I mean, you're teaching. It'd be a pleasure to have you. And I'm sure if I've dominated most of the conversation, I'm excited to be here, excited to talk with you. No, man, it's a good listening practice for me. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of good stuff to share. So if people want to see your book, that's called Dancing Deeper Still. And they can find that, I'm sure, online. And your website is Martin Keo, And the Keo is spelled K-E-O-G-H, martinkeogh.com, right? Mm-hmm. And yep, you can find my itinerary there and all my books um, are available. You, know, you can find them there. And I'll see you on a dance floor somewhere in the world. Yeah, I just signed up for your newsletter. If you have any 2019 dates, then do send them to me. I'll get anywhere okay. in the world. I'll get some, something in my calendar. Happy to travel. So, um, yeah, hopefully I'll be meeting up with you on the dance floor. Do you have a, a closing message, Martin, about the body for our listeners? Oh, boy. Um, just that life is too short to hesitate for fear of looking foolish. Um, jump in. That would be it. <laughs> Mine. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embody Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body. <laughs>